Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter once again. As I promised last week when I was talking about the other holidays we've been celebrating this month, I was going to spend some time talking about the Easter holiday as well. Uh, Perhaps rightly so, um, whenever people from uh, the Churches of Christ, from our fellowship, Um, talk about Easter, we tend to say, now we celebrate the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection every Sunday. And that is correct. And we ought to do that. Um, And so uh, it's important to commemorate um, the Lord's table every Sunday whenever we assemble. And we focus on what Jesus did for us in dying and being buried and being resurrected on the third day. Um, And so when we're taking some time to commemorate um, the particular day of his resurrection, I thought it would be interesting to take a slightly different tack. Uh, And only slightly different in the sense that we're going to uh, sort of turn the camera of our attention, if I can use that terminology, um, to the other people in the situation and not focus solely on Jesus throughout this. Uh, We're going to be reading from John chapter 20, so if you'd like to turn there in your scriptures this morning, that's where we'll be. But as we're reading this, we're going to be looking at the people who are sort of in, uh, actually they're experiencing the things that are happening um, uh, to Jesus, through Jesus, um, in these moments, Um, and the way that they are responding to those things rather than uh, solely look at the sort of divine aspect through Jesus and how that helps us to understand um, our relationship to God even better. So let's start at the beginning of the chapter here, John chapter 20. Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Um, So there's a few things to look at. Um, when we're looking at this first part of the story. First thing I'll do is jump up a couple of verses from where we were um, and uh, look at verse 41 there. Um, Jesus is being buried in a new tomb um, in which nobody uh, had ever been laid. Uh, This uh, is, uh, is sort of customary for that time and that region of the world. Um, and uh, it's not totally alien to us either. Um, there are plenty of people who have family crypts or family mausoleums where <laughs> multiple family members uh, or their remains in some fashion, whether that's uh, cremated remains or their actual uh, intact remains, will all be sort of put into the same vault or the same area, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this might be more common with families with a little bit more money because you've got to construct the whole thing to begin with. Um, But we also have this for um, various other things. If I'm remembering correctly, in Arlington National Cemetery, there's a sort of a a mausoleum or a crypt where multiple, um, you know, soldiers are entombed in the same sort of structure um, where it's for a particular... um, Uh, you know, type of service or a particular type of, uh, you know, uh, sacrifice for the country that had been made. They attained to this honor of being entombed in this one place altogether. Uh, The reason why I'm mentioning that and not saying any details is I saw it on NCIS once, and that's the only reason I know that it exists. I didn't actually see it in real life. Never been to D.C., maybe one day. Um, But anyway, 
let's continue on um, with our uh, looking at Jesus uh, being buried here. Now, it wouldn't be that surprising if this was a used tomb for them to show up and see an empty spot. Because what happens after you embalm a body at this time and you leave it behind for a long time uh, is that the rest of the flesh tends to go away and you're left with bones. And then the bones are moved to a special sort of ossuary position where just the bones are kept and then the slab where another um, corpse can be left or uh, you know another cadaver however you want to pronounce let's say that the dead body can be put there f to go through the process again they're embalmed they're entombed there but they sort of lay out on a slab until they are bones and then the bones get moved um, and this isn't exclusive to this part of the world but um, that's essentially what's happening here that we should know about the part that's significant is of course Jesus is the one and only body that has ever been in this tomb, and it remained uh, so, uh, you know, after his burial here. He, he is now, um, now the tomb is entirely vacant, not just missing Jesus. So um, the apostles and uh, the, uh, Mary Magdalene have witnessed the fact that the tomb is empty, and so uh, we're getting on to the next part of the story here with verse 10 and Jesus himself showing up. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said those things to her. So, um, as we're looking at this story, we can see that the resurrected Jesus has not ascended to uh, to heaven yet, um, and so he has uh, instructed Mary very explicitly here in verse 17. He says, do not hold on to me. Now, I don't think that, I've heard a couple of people say something along these lines, and I think they're maybe missing the point. It's not that there's something materially different about Jesus' body right now where Mary hanging on to him is going to um, do something to her or, or that he's not supposed to be touched right now. Uh, that's not really what's happening. I actually mentioned this a few weeks, maybe two weeks ago in a Bible class that we were talking about. Um, he didn't cling to the form of God, or maybe that was an evening sermon. Anyway, the whole point was um, that the same words being used here, Jesus is saying, don't hold on to me. I got some place to go. I got things to do. I, I, you know, you, you can't hold me right here because I need to move on, I uh, haven't returned to the Father. And so what we see uh, going forward is that he appears to the disciples there in just a few verses, um, which we will read. And then uh, we'll, again to, uh, in verse, uh, chapter 21, he'll appeal, appear to the apostles again at that time uh, out by the lake. And as we're looking at these uh, situations, one thing continues to happen. The change between uh, Jesus being dead and Jesus now coming back to life has sort of sets in in stages, right? Um, first of all, there's a, a body missing, and they don't understand why. Why is Jesus' body missing? Mary says, thinking that Jesus was the gardener, oh, if you put his body someplace, just tell me and, and I'll take care of it. If, uh, if it's been moved, uh, let, let, let us do what needs to be done there. Uh, and uh, then 
realizing it's Jesus, she goes and tells uh, the disciples what had happened there. So let's continue on. This is the, the uh, same day here, the resurrection day in the evening, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive, any, forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we see this reaction um, of sort of shock and disbelief and uh, fear almost uh, that comes from Jesus' body disappearing. And then this awe and reverence that comes from uh, Mary re getting the re uh, resurrected Jesus revealed to her first and then the rest of the disciples here. But there's one particular point about all of this that I want to especially make this morning as we're looking at all of these people. What happened in verse 9 uh, in John's recording of this is important. First of all, uh, just to refresh our memories, the disciple who uh, Jesus loved uh, that um, is being referred to in these passages is John himself. Uh, for whatever reason, um, he refers to himself euphemistically um, as the disciple whom Jesus loved um, whenever he's recording his gospel here. And so he and Peter, uh, upon uh, Mary Magdalene's uh, revelation that Jesus' body was missing, are the ones who first go to the tomb. Uh, and then he reaches and looks inside first, and then Peter goes on in. Um, and uh, we, we see from all of this that when he is talking about himself in verse 9, what is it that he says about himself and about uh, Peter, who's with him at least, if not all of the believers at this time? They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Okay. So I want to give you all this verse to have to take home with you and have rattle around in your head whenever you're talking to another Christian. Maybe for the rest of your life, but at least for the rest of the week. These guys who had been with Jesus during his entire ministry, been going around, been preaching on his behalf, performing miracles on his behalf, listening to Jesus tell them, I'm going to have to die, going through all of these things with Jesus, still didn't get it. At this point. And yet, just a few verses later, in verse 22 and in verse 23, Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit and he tells them that whatever sins they forgive will be forgiven, and whatever sins they do not forgive will not be forgiven. That's a lot of responsibility for guys who didn't get it just a few verses ago. So what I want you to think about when you're reading this verse, and you're talking to other Christians, other people who believe in God, is that if someone still doesn't understand from Scripture... If they believe in Jesus, he probably has work for them to do. Now, that doesn't mean they don't need to understand better. That doesn't mean that they don't need correction and they don't need the Holy Spirit to guide them. But it does mean that they don't stop being disciples just because they look at the empty tomb and they don't understand that Jesus is, had to come back from the dead. They didn't understand the scripture, but they were still Jesus' disciples, regardless. They still believed in him, and they still followed him, and they still would continue to understand and believe and follow him. Uh, sorry, they would still continue to believe and follow him even after attaining a better understanding. 
So, if nothing else, I, I would like for us to have this understanding. It's not our authority that determines who is a disciple and who isn't. It's not our understanding of scripture that's the sort of measuring stick by which we determine whether somebody is a disciple or not. That's for God to decide. What our responsibility is, is to believe even when we're faced with an empty tomb type of situation. Even when you go looking for God and you don't find him, you still believe he is who he says he is. So when he shows up and you, you see his, the evidence, in this case, the marks on his hands and in his side, that you know that he in, is indeed the Lord. But not just that. Jesus knew what Mary was looking for when he addressed her in verse 15 and said, why are you crying and who is it you are looking for? Um, and so when he answers her and calls her by name, and then she immediately wants to, now it, the scripture doesn't say this explicitly, but when he says, don't hold on to me, I have to imagine that she's grabbing him, right? <laughs> She sees him, she's amazed that he's alive, she calls him, you know, great teacher, um, and she, she grabs onto him and hugs him, and he says, now don't hold on to me right now, don't hug me right now, I got, I got places to be, now don't, don't, don't cling to me, because I have not yet returned to the Father. Uh, it's interesting that the first sort of... Uh, message that Jesus gives to somebody after his resurrection goes uh, to a woman. Now, you could probably make a little too much out of that if you want to, but Mary uh, being the one who gets the message to go back and tell the disciples, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and to your God, has one particular piece of significance in that when it gets delivered to them, there's nothing to go and check that time. So the first message uh, uh, that uh, Mary gave to them just a little while ago, earlier in the day, was the tomb is empty. And Peter and John went and looked, and indeed the tomb was empty. But the second time, when Mary has another message, I saw the Lord, and he said, I, I'm going to, uh, returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. They couldn't go and look, because Jesus wasn't going to wait to confirm. He said, don't cling to me, i got to go to heaven. So they not only had to have faith in Jesus, but they had to have trust with one another. They had to know who Mary was, and know that she was... Uh, someone that, that she, the, their sister, who that they could trust in the faith, and to be able to take her word. There was nobody to go and check with, but the Holy Spirit, but with God himself, you know. And Jesus confirms that when he arrives and gives them all the Holy Spirit. Now, we give Thomas a lot of grief a lot of times when we're looking at the next part of this story, starting in verse 24. But really, the only sort of wrong that Thomas has committed was missing a meeting <laughs> of church, right? He just wasn't there the last time God, Jesus showed up among them. And so when he asks for evidence in that passage, he's not necessarily showing any doubt in the Lord, as much as he's just showing his sort of skeptical side towards his fellow believers. So let's just read what uh, happens here and Jesus' response to Thomas and his understanding of this situation. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. 
And one week later, the disciples were, with the, were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's worth reading that part of the story this morning because uh, we're all Thomas to some sort. We're all the person Jesus was talking about to Thomas in that sort of a degree. Although I may have been right when I misspoke just a second ago. We may all be Thomas <laughs> to a certain degree too. Sometimes we want more proof. And sometimes we want uh, confirmation of what it is that we believe. But more uh, to the point, we are in the category of those people Jesus was telling Thomas about. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. None of us were there in the room when Jesus appeared to the disciples, but we have faith that he did indeed appear to them and that he was, brought, uh, that he was resurrected from the dead. So when we're reflecting on these situations, and we're trying to understand how this uh, shapes our relationship with God. Let's keep this particular blessing in mind alongside that sort of uh, commentary that John gave on himself uh, there back in verse 9. That we might be in this great category, this amazing sort of group of people who believe even though we don't have evidence to back it up. If we go on faith alone and not the proof that we can get from our own eyes and our own experience. But greater than that, we have to hold in importance that everyone that we come into contact with, who is a Christian who professes belief in Christ, has this same level of faith. Has, this, has attained to this sort of an understanding of the Lord. The, those who have not seen, yet have believed. So whether or not doctrinally, practically, uh, just superficially, we will align with the people who believe in Christ around us, we do have this same category of blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed in common. So when we're trying to interact with people who believe in Jesus, whatever that means for them, we need to give them the grace that even the apostles needed to have, that when they still didn't understand scripture, they were still counted as believers. Now, let me be this 100% clear here. I am not telling you that you should give up on professing what the scripture actually says. If something is scripturally correct, it doesn't matter if it's traditionally or doctrinally correct. I, I hope that if I found a piece of scripture that contradicted one of our common core and important practices... In this church today, I don't have anything in mind, but just saying as an example, if I told you that we were doing something absolutely wrong based on what the scripture said, that you would all say, well, let's do what scripture says and change your minds right now and not wait for somebody to approve of it on a human level. But I also understand that that's not easy. When you've got a whole community behind you telling you that one way is one way to do it and another way is another way to do it, it might make it hard for you to accept what scripture actually says. So what my encouragement for us today is, is to be able to extend some understanding and hopefully even sympathy uh, to those who have a lack of understanding. And as we always say, from the scripture, speak the truth in love and help guide them to a better understanding of what God would have us to do in our day-to-day -day walk with him, as well as the worship that we share together as believers. And, and I hope also as we reflect on Jesus' resurrection uh, as the centerpiece of this story, we can truly understand 
what the real value of the Christian relationship is. Now, I've been focused a lot on sort of Christian life and, and how we should behave ourselves, but we don't get to that without Jesus' resurrection. There's no point in even pretending to be a Christian if all you want to do is be a nice person. If you're just looking for a motivational speech, if you're just looking for instructions on how to be good, you can find that anywhere else. There's plenty of good people in the world that aren't Christians. But we are Christians because we believe that Jesus died, was buried, and was raised on the third day. We affirm that in our faith, and because of that, we try to emulate him and along the way, become better people. If you don't have the foundation of your relationship with Christ being his death, burial, and resurrection, which we encounter through the uh, baptism that we undertake as believers, we'd encourage you to join with him now as we stand and sing.